invitation to Jesus to come sit with us. Um, Father God, I just ask that you allow your perfect and holy and precious Son to come and dwell with us right now. That he'll speak words that don't even come out of my mouth to the hearts of the students in front of me. That the reality of the gospel will be made anew. That the call and the cost of discipleship will have its true meaning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, we'll be beginning in Matthew chapter 7. And there's, I'm only reading one verse here. Um, as, as a culture, as a, as a Christian society, um, we have abandoned the true call and the true cost of discipleship. It's a huge thing for us here with our group. Um, we claim to be disciples making disciples. We, this is our first year in this campus and we failed. Um, not because of the students, because of our faith and lack thereof. So I take full responsibility of that. Um, but, in saying that, there's a direction that, that I must go and I, I'm going to beg and plead you guys to go as well. Um, and that's to this, this costly discipleship. And, and what I mean by that is we have settled for an all-inclusive, do-as-you-want Christianity. A Christian walk that Jesus comes and forgives you of your sin and there's no change in your life. There's no active repentance. There's no movement forward. There, there, there's nothing. We've settled with... with principles or doctrines or even a simple prayer and receive and that's it when in reality if you read through the scriptures and the teachings of Jesus we see something far greater we see a costly call of repentance and a costly call to follow and that's the direction we're going to move tonight um, I'm reading a book by Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and, and he has a quote in there. This is when Christ bids a man to follow him, he calls him to die. And what he means in this is that this life that we live is no longer our own. We've surrendered this life to a following of Christ. A day-by-day -day passionate following of Christ. And you guys know, I talk about this all the time, it's not just a one hour on Sunday. But it's not just a one hour every day. It's not just a little bit here, a little bit there. It's an all the time, every day cost of discipleship. So we see that we've cheapened up, and, and, and it, it's not just us. We fall victim to our parents, and our parents' parents, and our parents' parents, and our parents' parents' parents. Which is kind of similar to, didn't he say he's going to punish generations instead of third or fourth generation? So it's funny how it comes full circle. But we have cheapened up the gospel of Christ. Why? To fill our churches. To fill our bank statements. To fill our baptism number. When in the reality, we haven't came and look at scripture and see what does it truly cost to be a disciple? There, there comes to a point where, where, where I was reading and you see <clears throat> Jesus gives this lesson. And this isn't in Matthew 7, but he gives this lesson, I'll get to Matthew 7 in a second. He gives this lesson about the only way, the only way to enter the gates of heaven is to take of his flesh and eat and drink of his blood. And he gives this, this message to a multitude of people. And the very next section is about how many disciples depart from him. They weren't willing to pay the cost of discipleship. They weren't willing to step further. And Jesus, Jesus is, is there, and his, his 12 are in front of him. 
And he looks at them and he sees all these people deserting him. He says, well, what about you? You guys want to go too? And Peter steps up. Of course, it's Peter. And he goes, teacher, where will we go? You are the one who knows the way to eternal life. We're going to follow you. See, and, and that same thing lies true today. Teacher, where are we going to go? You are the one that knows the way to eternal life. But some of us see this cost and we, we think it's too difficult. We think we have to give up too much. If you hold your life as value, then yes, you're giving up too much. But if you believe in Scripture that your life has no value except for the glorification of Jesus Christ and God the Father, then it's an easy price to pay. Why would Jesus give the ultimate cost to his son? Or God could only cost Jesus. Pay the highest price for us if we in turn weren't willing to pay the highest price for him. Because we look at our life. Francis Chan does a great illustration. I'm not going to do that illustration. Most of you know it. We look at our life and it's a fragment of forever. It's a this and forever. A blink of the eye. And yet we hold so much value in this little blink. Because why? Our faith isn't in the eternity. What if the 70 years or 60 years is all there is? We don't have, we don't have this, this, this definite faith that this is meaningless. This life is going to come and pass in thousands and thousands and thousands of years from now when I'm either at the feet of Jesus or in the pits of hell. I'm not going to remember any of it. It all comes down to this little fragment of life that we have. What value do we put on this little fraction of forever? We have cheapened the cost of grace. We have cheapened discipleship. We have cheapened Christ. And it's sad. Most of us know people here. You, we read, we read uh, no, most of us read, this is a very solid group. And most of us read the scriptures and we go through and we see different stories. We see in Revelation when Christ talks about these lukewarm people that he's going to spew out of his mouth. If you get other translations, it says vomit, throw up out of his mouth because he's disgusted. And we go, yeah, that's sad. And we know some people that, man, yeah, they're definitely in there too. They're part of that lukewarm people. But we, do we not look at our life and say, how much have we given up? How much have we truly, are we truly on fire? Are we truly so hot that he, he takes delight in that? Are we just warmer than them? You know what I'm saying? Are we just warmer than them? It's still disgusting to him, but in our eyes, in our if we were the judge, yeah, we're kind of good enough. We've paid enough. We've done more than most people. What about Paul? What about John? What about Peter? What about Martin Luther? <coughs> Francis Chan, John Piper, what about them? How do we stack up to them? They're just men too. Now it gets a little colder. And they're not perfect. Don't get me wrong. They're trying their best from what we can see, both today and the people who have passed, to follow this word of God. <clears throat> it's time to, we need to come and understand the life of which Christ calls us to do the life of, of a man who's willing to pluck out his eye because it causes him to sin. A man who's willing to leave his nets and everything behind to follow Christ, to get up out of the table and go. That is the call of discipleship as we see biblically through Jesus Christ. That's how he calls his disciples. That's how he calls us today. To leave everything and follow him. 
The verse I'm talking about in Matthew 7 is verse 6. It says, Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. See, and this is the very thing I'm talking about. This is the cheapening of the gospel. This is the, let's boost our numbers, let's boost our accreditation, our acclaim, and sacrifice the true call and cost of discipleship. Grace is freely given, is it not? So if it's freely given, why can't we just receive grace and continue to live as we are? Or as we do, not as we are. We don't live as we are. But why do we, why do we receive this call of grace and continue to walk in the way we did? And it's so free. Because no, that's not what Jesus gives us. Jesus gives us a healing touch that puts faith in Him that's going to move us in directions. Jesus has touched your life. There's not been one man in the history of ever that Jesus has touched and they've been the same. That Jesus has came into their life and they've been the same. They've either gotten worse or better. Never been the same. So if you're walking the same as Jesus came in your life, you're the same dude you were five years ago as Jesus came in your life. the same person yesterday as you are today. It's Jesus working in your life. How many of us goes weeks and months and even years? Same place. Stagnant. There's no evidence of Jesus working. And it's a constant thing. Jesus is a constant thing. It's a pick of your cross daily and follow me. Imagine the life of the disciple, three years following Jesus. Do you not think they learned something new every day? Do you not think they were amazed every day? Do you think that Jesus is different today? No. And I fall leaps and bounds short of everything I'm talking about. So for me, it's very hard to come and tell you guys this when I can't abide by it either. I'm too weak. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. <coughs> but I have confidence that he is strong enough. And that he is smart enough. And that he's not too weak. So there, there comes a dependence in this call of discipleship. There becomes a a complete, utter dependence on Christ. When you read the Lord's Prayer, give us a stare of daily bread, there's a complete de dependence that you're going to feed me today, God. <coughs> there's a complete dependence that you're going to forgive me of my sins, God. That you're going to take care of everything I need. When you say, do not worry, I have to believe it. So we get to this part where it's like, don't throw what is sacred to pigs. Don't just give out, give out, give out. With no thinking, with no thought process. No, if you want to minister to a people, if you want to, if you want to help a people, don't just give them a book and send them on their way and say, good luck, read them a prayer, and then say, hey, you're saved, on your way. No, teach them the cost which they're going to have to pay. He talks about when a man goes to build a house, does he not take account all that he has to do before he starts building the house? As you get halfway through and it's halfway built and you're like, I have no more money to spend, how foolish do you look? If you live a Christian life halfway, then you're on dry. How foolish do you look? How embarrassing is that? Not only on yourself, but on Christ. Let's take a look at the cost and let's choose in our life. Do we really want to abide by this? Do we really want our treasures only to be in heaven? Are we satisfied with having the minimums here on earth? Are we satisfied with lowering ourselves to the least of these? To look at our brother saying, man, whatever you need. We're going to get in John, and he talks about, if anyone walks by a brother, 
and sees that they're in need and they have material possessions and they have no pity, the love of God is not in them. The reason we're going to go to 1 John is because it's very direct. And I think tonight we need to be very direct in the directions we're trying to go. So we're going to flip over to 1 John. <clears throat> it's near the back. Most of you know. I am... I have like dreams, like daydreams. Of a group of two, three, four men that <coughs> will walk with me and just be able to go into any building, any place, at any time. And just the presence of God to be there. Why? Because our lives are so focused on Him. That our 24-7 is around Christ. And the group of five is actually a group of six. And the group of four is actually a group of five. That we don't stand alone in the furnace. So we get to 1 John. John, one who heard the call of discipleship and went. And this is what he teaches us. I'm going to start with chapter 2, verse 15. We're going to go through some of the, we're not going to go through like, we're not going to read everything, but we're going to go through verses from the whole book. So we'll be bouncing around. I'll try to go in order to, to help us. Verse 15, reading through verse 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. Whoever does the will of God lives forever. So we see John here, and this is very clear. His first statement, don't love the world. What do you mean, John? Here's what I mean by don't love the world. Don't love the world because the lustful eyes, the lust of the flesh, and prideful desires stem from the world. And those things aren't part of the Father. You, you see? He's making a differentiation. There's a, Bonhoeffer talks about, it is a fight. A Christian life is a fight between the Christian and the world. It is a battle between... Do you, do, you, do you see the battle that we're at? We not only have spiritual warfare coming from the enemy, but we're battling the world at the same time. We're in a tug of war, and we're the rope. We have to battle both sides. Why? To walk on the straight and narrow path of Jesus Christ. And if He is our teacher, and He is our coach, and He is our rabbi, you know what He's doing? He's holding us. He picks us up. He says, we can do it. Let's walk. I got you. I know they're pulling you there. I know you're pulling you there. But I'm going this way, and you're coming with me. Let's go. This is a narrow path. I've done it before. I can do it again. If your life is revolved around Christ, your daily life goes with Him, that's the direction you're going to go. If you blank on Christ for a moment, guess what? You're getting pulled one way or the other. You will not be able to go on this path without Christ. So John talks about, do not love the world. This, like, like I said, this world is only a fraction of a blink of the eye. We hold so much value to it. <clears throat> and I love in 17, he says, man, it passes away. All things pass away. Do we love Jesus because of heaven? Or do we love Jesus because of Jesus? Because guess what? Heaven and earth will pass away. But the Lord's reward endures forever. What is our reward? Is our reward heaven? Or is it Jesus? Is it the place? Or is it the man? It's a question for us to answer at night alone. Do we want to go to heaven so we don't go to hell because we heard hell's a bad place? Or do we want to go to heaven because we know Jesus is there and he died for our sins and he is our redeemer and our savior. He's the one who said, I want to be your best friend. I want to be your shepherd. I want to be your everything. Where are our priorities at? And don't let, don't let people trick you. Don't let pagans trick you or Christians trick you or Muslims or anybody else. Don't let them trick you. If 
find your time alone with God where you say, man, where is the truth at? You say the truth is scripture, I'm going to read scripture. You say there's truth in prayer, I'm going to pray. You say your son is the truth, guess what? I'm going to find him. <clears throat> and he ends it. Remember we have heaven and hell pass away. But look what he says at the end of 17. Whoever does the will of God lives forever. That's the promise. That's what this life is for. To do the will of God. Why? So we can get our eternal glory, our eternal love, our eternal everything through Jesus if we abide in the will of God. <clears throat> verse 26 in the same chapter, chapter 2, verse 26, I'm going to read 26 through 27. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not yet anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as this anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. So he's talking about this. Once you meet Christ, he doesn't stop. Why? Because Philippians, Paul talks about this. He says, well, uh, Christ is not clear. He says, no, he completes everything he starts. He who began a good work in you will complete it. And John is on the same, there's the same spirit working through Paul that's working through John. That's working through every Christian in the world today. That's how the true believers, they all sound very similar. Why well, is the same spirit? They all have the same message. It's Jesus. So we have here, John, he's saying, I'm writing these things because people are going to try to trick you. What did I just say? Don't let people trick you. Don't let pagans, don't let Christians, don't let Muslims, don't let Satan, don't let anything trick you. Stay solid and firm. That's why John's writing this letter. So you'll know the truth. And he says, as far as teachers, you got the best one. If you didn't, tell, if you didn't know tonight, if you've received Christ, and I don't mean receive Christ and you go out and do your own thing, but you receive Christ and then you go, where are you going? And you follow him. You have the best pastor, rabbi, teacher there's ever been. Ever. Why do we put our faith in, in men? Most of you know me really well. How fallible am I? Very. How many times am I wrong? Every time. I'm telling you I've been wrong in this talk. Probably a lot. I haven't thought about it. But we're going to watch it later. It's probably a lot. <coughs> the things I know that are true are when I just read. That's when I know it's true. I know I'm 100% right here. Why? Because I'm just going to read. But he says you have this teacher who's going to teach you everything you need to know. So stay in him and he'll stay in you. Remember I talked about do you not think the disciples learn something new every day? But yeah, if you remain in Jesus every day, and He remains in you every day, you're going to grow every day. Your calling is going to be more and more every day. You're going to love Him more and more every day. But what happens when you get pulled left, or you get pulled right? You have to come back. And you might not have to start over, but you're a few steps backwards. There's a little bit of fear, like, I know God, I kind of let you down, and... You're not really trying to listen. You're kind of like the, the prodigal son who's like, I've sinned against God and I've sinned against you, Father. Please just let me be a servant. And he's like, no, I don't care. Just come into my house and let's have a party. But I've sinned against you and I've sinned against God. No, come into my house. You're home. And we do that when we fall off track. We go, God, I know God, I'm sorry. I'm kind of, you know, I don't really want to, I'm sorry. I don't know if we want to be together right now. You're probably mad at me. And he's like, no, just come back. The longer you stay out there, yeah, I'm going to get more upset. Come back, we'll be fine. We'll go inside. We'll have a party. We'll kill the best calf. We'll do whatever. You're home, son. You're home. Let's go. 
John was writing this, and he's like, you have this teacher who, who teaches, and he says it's not counterfeit. It's not fake. This, this daily walk, the spiritual growth that comes with it, it's not fake. It's, it's legit. It's the real thing. I know it's the real thing. So remain in Him. <clears throat> so we continue, and, and I love how He gives commands. John, in, in 1 John, a lot of like, think, do this, do this. Think, I need you to walk in this way. He also talks about God. He talks about the glorious riches of God. And we're going to get into that right now. If you get the beginning of chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 1 verse, verse, or through verse 3. It says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that we don't know, or they don't know Him. Dear friends, now we are all children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. All who have this hope in Him purify Himself, just as He is pure. So you see, how loving is our God that He is a holy, perfect God that should have nothing to do with sinful humanity, yet He says, those are my children. Look at the love He's poured on us. What is the love? The blood of Christ that He's poured on us. Why? To purify us so we can be called children of God. You see how He started verse 1 and He kind of reciprocated through 3 back to 1. The same idea of, here you're children of God. Why? Because of this. Here we go. I got you. When He comes back, His purification will purify us. See, so yeah, we're children of God. Cool. Why? Because of Jesus. Why do we do the things that we do? Why do we walk in abidance with Christ? Here's the best answer. Because Jesus died on the cross. Why do I love my wife? Why do I love my husband? Because Jesus died for my sins. Why don't you beat your children? Because Jesus died for my sins. That's the, that is the beautiful answer of why we live the life the way we do. Because Jesus died and he came back again. And he said, you have a chance. Now come walk with me. <coughs> we continue... The next one I'm going to read is, it's a bigger section. It's verse 16, the same chapter 3. Yes, most of you know John 3.16. Probably the most famous verse in the whole world. First John 3.16 is super cool. <coughs> we're going to read through that. We're going to, we're going to get through 24. But I'm going to take it slow. First John 3.16. This is how we know what love is. This is how we know what love is. That Jesus Christ laid down his life for us as we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. This is how we know what love is. That Jesus Christ laid down his life. The ultimate sign of the love of God the Father is through his son's sacrifice. And then he continues, as we should do the same. Is that a high cost or a low cost? I'll let you judge. I'll let you judge. But if you read it with purity and truth, you'll see He's calling us to something greater than what we are. He's calling us to a discipleship that is more than what we're doing today. This is the part I was talking about earlier, verse 17. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? <laughs> yes, a rhetorical question. It can't is the answer. It cannot. If you see a brother or sister in need and you have the ability to help, eh, I don't really care. There's no love of God in you. 
He doesn't say there might not be. He says, no, there's none. It's very solid. He continues, 18. And this is, uh, this is my key verse of the night. 1 John 3, 18. It says, Dear children, not, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. I can sit here every Wednesday. I see most of you guys every day of the week. I can say, man, I love you guys. You guys are great. Let's walk together. Let's do this. Let's do that. But if I do not go home, and I do not go to God the Father, and I do not pray, and I don't think about your well-being above mine, because if I'm telling you to hold your life to a value, what am I doing if I'm holding my life to a higher value than you? I want to be your biggest supporter, guys. If you guys want to do anything, I want to help. If you want to do a Bible study at a different school, I want to help. If you have another event, I want to help. I want to do whatever I can. You guys, you guys have high school kids. I want to be able to do whatever you need. If you need money to take them to Taco Bell, I'll get you money. Anybody, if you guys need anything, I want to help. If you have a friend in prison, I want to help. say it's worthless. I leave right now and never see you guys again. What do my words mean? Nothing. But what if I actually do it? What if we together actually do it? What if Christ just said it and didn't do it? Yeah, I'll die in the town for all your sins, but he never ended up on the cross. What if the conspiracy theories are right? No, he let his disciples take the place. But now we see evidence that Christ died and he came back again. He didn't just say it, he did it, he lived it. Everything he said, he did. That's the example. chapter 4, <coughs> and I'm just going to read verse 7 through 21. And then another verse and we'll be done. Um, but let's take note. Let's take note to the words of God. It says, Dear friends, this is chapter 4, but it says that chapter 4, verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. Before I continue, you're going to see the repetition. This is how God showed his love. That he sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we follow love, or if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Do we not see that everything that we're being called to do, Christ has already done and continuing to do. The cost, he's still, he's paid it. He's went through it. He's not calling because it's something he did not do himself. And he says, you know what, I'm going to help you through it. I'm going to walk you through it. 1 Corinthians 10.13, I'm not going to give you something you can't handle. He says... Love is shown in what? The crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We need to preach the cross more. We need to preach the cross more. Why? Because that is the ultimate expression of the love of God. Verse 13. This is how we know 
that we live in him and he lives in us, that he's given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be our Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God and God lives in them, and they in God, and so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. I want you to see there's an inner being, there's an inner interaction here, that God living in you and you in God, it's complete, it's intimate, it's together. You're never going to be alone once you follow God. God will be with you. It's a, it's a back and forth. God will be in you if you're in God and it's, it's, it's growing, it's climbing, it's an intimate expression. 17. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Now, have we not seen that since Jesus did this, we ought to do the same? Since Jesus did this, we ought to do the same. Jesus died for us, as we ought to lay down our life for our brothers and sisters. Jesus did this. We ought to do the same. John said it many a times. Now he gets to this pinnacle in chapter 4, where he says, In this world, we are like Jesus. I'm not saying you are Jesus. I'm saying you have the characteristics of Jesus. And because you have the characteristics of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the joy of Jesus, the peace of Jesus, and the heartbreak of Jesus, you're going to see this world very differently. You're going to act very differently. When you see your brothers and sisters hurt, you're going to hurt. It's part of the cost. But this is our confidence in the day of judgment, that we know that we belong in Him and He in us. Verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made imperfect, or not made perfect in love. I'm going to reword verse 19. Not reword, I'm adding one word. Two. We, here's what I'm adding, are able. We are able, I want three words, two. We are able to love. We have the ability to love. <coughs> Why? Because he first loved us. He showed us what love is. He showed it to us. That's why we have the ability to love. He says, I know you have the ability to love. You cannot stand on the day of judgment. I didn't know how to do it. I know you told me to love. I didn't know how to do it. No. You're able to love. Why? Because I loved you first. I showed you what it is. I walked with you about it. You did not know what love was until I entered your life. But then you were able to love. Remember that tree you hung me on? I showed you it there. You remember when I called Adam up from dust and breathed into his lungs? I showed you it there. When I made that first covenant with Abraham, I showed you it there. When I gave the sheep for Isaac, I showed you it there. over and over and over again. We love because He first loved us. And I'm not going to leave you. I, I could leave you without 20 and 21. That would not do justice to God. Because we get kind of dirty here. Our hands get dirty with these last two verses. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. John's saying, you're a liar. Jesus is saying you're a liar. I'm saying up here, I'm going to tell you, you're a liar. If you claim to love God, but you hate your brother and sister, these are the dirty, ugly verses that people don't like to talk about, but here's the truth. John is not afraid to say this. Why? Because there's no fear in love. I'm not afraid to read these verses to you. Why? Because there's no fear in my love. Forever still in 20. For whoever does not love their brother or sister 
whom they have seen cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brothers and sisters. <clears throat> the love of God in us is seen how we handle the people around us, how we handle our brothers and sisters. we get angry at them? Is it because we don't like what they're doing or because they're not abiding in the will of God? I don't want to make those two different things right now. If we don't like what they're doing, that's selfish pride. Remember we talked about selfish pride. That does not come from God. But if we see what they're doing is against God and it, it hurts us and it makes us sad, that's not selfish pride. That is a love that comes from the heartbrokenness of Jesus saying, please just come back and follow me. And that's us crying out, please come back and follow him. I've seen where your life is going. I've seen what you're doing. You're killing yourself. The last verse. I'm going to read it and then we'll just go to the last ten. Um, I don't need to explain it. We have a good teacher, right? We just read that. I don't have to explain anything. I could have just read. And this is the te oh, I'll tell you the verse. 5.11. It says, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. This life is in His Son. Whoever has a Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. It's as black and white clear and simple as that. I'm going to pray a little bit last then. Oh, Father God, help us take the word that you have given us and let it change us. That we not make our heart callous to it. That we not just say, yeah, I know, I know, I know, but that we will actually look at it and look at our sinfulness and turn from our pride and say, God, I need you to be the center in everything in my life. That I'm willing to drop my nets and follow you. Whatever our nets may be. God, nothing will happen unless we abide in the call that you have given us to be a disciple and a child and a friend. Your son's holy and perfect name. Amen.